Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. Welcome if you're new, make sure you hit that subscribe button and let's get right into this video. So today we have a very special guest, Sister Spice. Hello everyone. I'm just kidding. Hi everyone. Hey everyone. Guess what I got today? Creepy Reddit stories. Oh yeah. <laughs> we are doing Sister Spice's 21st birthday Whoa. nails. That's my 21st birthday. I'm a Taurus baby. So uh, we got a lot to go through. We got a lot of stuff. This is gonna be a jam-packed, very jam-packed set. It's cause I'm a Taurus. Mm -hmm. I'm a material girl. We're gonna call this nail set a pink kawaii boss bee charmed nail. Okay. So let me just show you everything that we're gonna need for this nail set. Cause there's a lot. So here's the poly gels. This is gonna be a pink nail set. Oh, and this is also part one. We're only doing one hand today. We're gonna do the other hand in the next video. So I have these five different pink colors right here. Here's how they look. This middle row and also this color down here. And we're also going to need a clear for encapsulating. Next, we have some little nail decorations. We're gonna be using this hot pink glitter. And we have these tiny heart charms, as well as these gold butterfly charms, and some other random little charms. And look what Sister Spice brought. I brought my own supply kit of stuff here. She brought some pink kawaii giant nail charms because she always asked me to do sets on her that I don't have the stuff for. But she brought her own things today. <laughs> this is kind of like the main star of the nail set. But that's what we're going to be using for this one hand. The other hand is going to have a little bit more complex nail set. But for this one, it's just kind of a little bit simple, but also not. It's just simple with some ginormal charms. <laughs> yes, yeah, ginormal. So let's just get right into this nail set. So here's how Sister Spice's nails are looking. They're quite crusty. But when are they not crusty? You know, they're always <laughs> crusty in the beginning. I've been walking around with these hands like this. <laughs> so we're just going to start off with the nail prep. I'm going to start by pushing back the cuticles. Okay, next I'm going to use this circular cuticle drill bit and I'm just going to work this around the cuticle area. Now that we got all that dead skin lifted up, I'm just going to trim all of it off. Now I'm going to smooth out the free edge of the nails. Okay, now I'm going to take my fine grit sanding band and I'm just going to file over the surface of the nails. Just kind of make them nice and smooth and also file around the cuticle area. just going to clean these off wipe all this dust off the nails okay so we just have our nail tips here these are like the extra long square ones that i've really been liking recently so i'm just gonna get sizing these out okay now i'm just going to glue on the nail tips Thank you. 
Okay, tips are glued on. Now we're just going to trim them down. Trim them down? We're trimming them down. I'm not keeping them this long. Like here. Ah! I'll do some short office nails. Ooh. Girl, what are you doing? <laughs> Back it up. Put it like maybe like right there. Okay, we didn't really trim them down. We trimmed off the number. That's it. Okay, now I'm just going to reshape them a little bit. So after a little bit of reshaping, I'm just going to remove the shine from the nail tips. Okay, next step is going to be adding on some dehydrator. This is really what's going to make your nails last. And same thing with some primer. Okay, finally, let's add on a layer of base coat. Okay guys, let's get into this poly gel application. So we're gonna start on the pointer finger. We're just gonna take this nail by nail, even though the designs aren't really that complicated, they're all just kind of different though. So on the pointer finger, we're gonna be using this glittery pink color and I'm just gonna make that the whole nail. And Sister Spice is gonna get into the creepy Reddit stories. Hello everyone, it's me Sister Spice and I've heard that I've been heavily requested for my Reddit stories. I hope that's true, that just made my day. Um, um, I have a few here and I don't know which one to start with. Okay, so this Reddit story that we're gonna first read, it's under the subreddit No Sleep and the title is I'm a taxi driver. The other night I had a passenger I will never forget. We are all cursed and we can't even see it. Our own eyes won't show us. I was always under the cocky impression that my taxi and I knew the streets of Berlin like no other. You can't begin to imagine the unexpected horrors I've witnessed during my night shifts. You see, people show far less inhibition when it's dark and sometimes they're even reveal a whole different identity. Still, even my 15 years of experience couldn't help prepare me for that one night. Berlin is quite the adjustment if you come from such a small village like the one I'm from. I've grown up to like my work in the city, but it has its cursed side, and that's mostly due to the people. Peculiar people that might appear friendly and normal during the day, but change entirely as soon as the sun goes down. As a driver, I've learned to observe and notice things, like when I happen to drive a member of some criminal family around you won't believe how many of those we have in berlin but it's not my place to judge i'm just a driver i have a ton of stories some sweet and some disgusting but there is only one night of driving in all these years that has left me sick to my stomach one that's left such a bitter aftertaste that nothing i eat brings me joy anymore and that's the night i met julius when i don't get a call to go pick someone up i wait in line with the other taxis at the metro station sometimes i spend hours there having a coffee and a cigarette with other drivers while waiting for passengers. We tell each other superficial stories about our lives and make bets on who will have the best fare of the night. One time I drove a man to a city 200 miles away, made the same money I'd usually get for three entire nights. Julius' fare was in similar price range even though we never left Berlin. At the end of the night, I didn't ask him for money. It was a cold and foggy night typical for the beginning of March, the type of night that you'd rather just spend in bed if you don't have to work like me. I remember thinking that when the passenger door of my taxi suddenly opened from the outside, letting in a cold gust of wind. The cold swiftly disappeared again as this young man with dark hair and just as dark eyes smiled at me. Are you free for a ride? He asked. This man could have been 20 or 36. I honestly couldn't say for sure, but I remember vividly how he was radiating something warm and comfortable. He was wearing slacks and a black jacket underneath a nice white shirt. I don't know much about clothes, but I could tell that someone had perfectly tailored his wardrobe to his body. Maybe that's why I believed him when he said that this would be a long ride, but that he had enough money to pay for it. Of course I said yes, and he had any luggage I could help him with. 
Just this, he held up a little wrapped package the size of a book and grinned, but it'll be on my lap. He sat down in the passenger seat. Some people do that, usually the ones that are alone and feel like talking. Where can I take you to? Do you have an address? I asked. He fastened his seatbelt. No, not exactly. I'll just give you the directions as we go, if that's all right. And that's what we did. It was fine for me as long as the meter was running. Dill, that's a nice name, he said. After looking at the card I have in front of my car with my name and number on it. Thank you, I said while starting the car. It means heart. It's a... I looked behind me to safely leave the line of cars, but froze when I noticed that the cars behind me were gone. And not just the other taxis. Everyone was gone. The entire outside around the metro station looked deserted. I looked at Julius, but he didn't even seem to notice anything was wrong. He just smiled. For a split second, I swear I saw something moving in the reflection of the window next to him, but when I blinked, it was gone. Heart, that's beautiful, he said casually. I swallowed and rubbed my eyes. Another look outside proved to me that I've been imagining things. There were people with bags rushing to their cars, taxi drivers standing around with a cigarette, drunken teenagers loudly chatting. Everyone was normal. So he rubbed his eyes and it was like, this, you know, regular, mm -hmm. the scene that he remembers. It was after 3 a.m. These things happen during night shifts. Your mind gets foggy. I just couldn't let this man notice. I didn't want to lose a fare. That would make such good money. Luckily, he was oblivious and continued our conversation. I go by Julius, but I have no clue what that means. We both laughed. Well, it's nice to meet you, Julius, I said and meant it. We passed one of my taxi driver buddies as we drove off. He tilted his pale face as he watched us drive off with a distraught look in his eyes. I felt a knot in my stomach as I passed him, but didn't yet understand what my gut was trying to say. When there are passengers in my car, I have the occasional chat with them about the weather or the latest football game, but I'm not a talkative man. Some people pour out their souls, but those are the ones I use the least words with. Once in a while, however, I meet a special person who doesn't simply talk to fill the silence in the car, but who is genuinely and truly interested in the lives of others. Julius was just like that, special. Do you have night shifts often? He asked as we drove down a particularly dark road. Only on weekends. Monday's best, Friday and Saturday nights, I said. You must sleep away the rest of your weekend then, huh? He laughed, and I joined in. Well, sleep is a powerful thing. There's nothing more comfortable than resting your head on a soft pillow after a long night, I said. Okay, so I just did two layers, but it's still not that thick. It's like not thick enough, so I'm just gonna add one more layer. I absolutely agree. If I could sleep forever, I would, he laughed, but it sounded forced. It's ironic, isn't it? We work so hard to earn a living, but as a result, we wind up losing that time to actually go out and live. With all his confidence, there was also a melancholic side to him. His charisma reminded me of my older brother but in some ways I also saw myself in him. I sighed. If it were up to me, I'd have a simple life, a small house in a village with a garden, plant my own veggies, and maybe have a couple of chickens. I added to his thought. Julius turned to me with a raised eyebrow. Our eyes met for a second before I had to turn mine back to the street in front of us. His eyes were incredibly dark, as if they only consisted of pupils. I know that sounds creepy, but it wasn't. It felt familiar. Distracted by our conversation, it took me a while to realize that we were driving down roads I'd never seen before. Driving in between multi-story buildings without any lights on. Well, it was the middle of the night, but still. And it felt incredibly strange not to recognize my surroundings. I'm a taxi driver. I've always felt like I knew the whole city. Well, something must have happened down that road of yours to end up in the biggest city in Germany then, Julius interrupted my thoughts. I laughed. I'm here because of my family. The village life with chickens isn't for them, I said surprising myself. I never open up to strangers. No, I never open up to people at all. Oh, Julius called out as he leaned back a little. You're a family man. Of course you're a family man. And we do everything for our families, right? The way he said those words made me feel a little odd for a second, but I shrugged it off. Always, Julius smiled. We interrupted our conversation as we'd arrive at Julius's first destination a small kiosk where he needed to drop off his mystery package. I'll be back in a sec. Wait here. He looked at me with a surprisingly intimidating look. If you don't know what a kiosk looks like, it's basically a tiny corner shop. The windows are filled with beer crates and bottles, so you can't see inside too well. I had no idea what happened when Julius was in there, only that after a few minutes, all the lights inside the shop suddenly turned off. 
the little shop that was the only source of light on this dark street anyways, now almost disappeared in front of my eyes. I had weirdly trusted this stranger because everything seemed so fine and I'd felt so comfortable. But after he left the car, I got this odd feeling inside. A new sense of paranoia mixed with a rush of anxiety. Something inside me was shouting to get the hell away. Would you just drive off? Yeah, if I felt like that. I looked for my phone, but couldn't find it quickly enough. Impulsively, I set my foot on the gas and got ready to leave. But before I could, the back door of my car opened. Julius jumped back inside with the same friendly smile through those familiar eyes. Except now, he wasn't sitting next to me, but behind me. Where to now, my friend? I nervously asked, hoping he didn't realize that I was just about to take off. I don't know why I didn't simply tell him to F off for some reason. I couldn't find any courage. I'm glad you called me that. I'd like for us two to be friends still. He took a deep breath. Just follow the streets for now. I started driving again, following the streets as my passenger instructed me. Finally, I felt like I recognized the area again. We're back in my hometown. Still, my friend, let's get back to our family conversation. Do you get along well with your son? Son? He never said he had a son. I stayed silent for a moment. We used to be closer. Teenagers aren't always easy to deal with, I laughed. Oh yes, teenagers. Things are much better with your daughter, I assume. We're driving down a quiet neighborhood again with a few lights and I had to really focus on the street. Did he, did, did Dill nope. ever mention his daughter mm -mm. or son? He just said he had a family. I could, I could have two boys. How do you know I got a daughter and a son? Okay, so we finished the pointer finger. So the next nail is going to be a full nail of this jelly hot pink color. My daughter, well, she's a wonderful kid, but also a little bit off lately. Not quite herself. Teenager too, I get. I stopped speaking. We'd been driving around and talking for so long that it really took me a second to realize what had just happened. I never told him that I had a daughter and a son. Oh yes, she's more distant, locking herself up in her room, hardly eating any food anymore. That's unfortunate. You still love them though, am I right? He said. I felt incredibly nervous. I'd made some big mistakes by trusting this man with my thoughts all night. Something was definitely wrong, but I had to try my best to stay collected. He could have some really bad connections. Well, I have love for my family, but don't we all? I said nervously. No, you don't. Surprised at his sudden change of tone, I looked into the rear view window to make some eye contact. Julius, the man I had been driving around with all night, was gone. I looked into the face of a creature I had never seen before. His dark eyes that felt so kind earlier now looked completely wrong as if someone had slammed a screwdriver into his eye sockets and filled them with a dark void. There were holes in his face, filled with some kind of fungi. Repulsed by his entirely wrong face, I forgot to watch the street for a moment and almost crashed into a parked car. I swerved just in time, catching my breath and collecting my courage. My heart was beating so fast, I thought it would jump out of my chest. It was late at night. I hadn't slept. I didn't have any water for hours. I was hallucinating, I told myself. Though all the same time, I couldn't bring myself to look in that mirror again. Is something wrong, my friend? He chuckled. I instinctively turned my head around and saw the same Julius with his regular face sitting there with a smile on his face. Maybe it's just in the reflection because he said he's seen something in a reflection of the window. What's those creatures in Sam and Dean that do that. Oh, I can't you remember, remember. But you remember what I'm yes. talking about. Only in the reflection you can tell mm -hmm. what they are. Yeah, sorry I mumbled. Long night. Slowly, I tried to collect myself again. What did you do inside the kiosk? I finally asked, surprised at my own sudden courage. Even if that face was a hallucination, but this man still knew things about my children that he shouldn't. He seemed so interested in my life earlier. In reality, he wasn't trying to get any information out of me, though. He already knew everything. What was this man trying to get from me? I had to get rid of him, but be smart about it. So I decided to drive towards the home of my brother. My brother, well, he is an intimidating man with a lot of power. A shady man who doesn't shy away from violence. If this Julius meant danger, he'd know what to do. Julius' eyes were closed. I thought he might have fallen asleep, so I quickly changed the, the directions. I tried to stay confident, but my entire body was shaking at this point. As if he was reading my mind, Julius' eyes opened, and I knew without a shadow of doubt that this night would ruin the rest of my life. Don't try to be smart, Dill. Julius suddenly spoke with, with a low voice. I clenched the steering wheel so hard that it looked like the skin on my hands would crack open any second. I know where you are going. Don't. I have no interest in meeting your brother. Not tonight. 
he spoke. How do you, I whispered. I know you saw me in the mirror. You didn't scream. I like that. You know, I feel like I can be myself around you, he grinned. My eyes went to the rear view mirror. None of this was a hallucination. I didn't know how to describe it in better words, but I know for a fact that this thing was not human. It was hiding behind human skin. Now, I'm gonna be honest because I do truly enjoy your company. This night wasn't about dropping off the package. That's a different business of mine. Tonight was about getting to know you. A million different thoughts were racing through my mind, but all I asked was, why me? He chuckled again. <laughs> Don't be worried, my friend. I can feel this entire car shaking. I'm not here to hurt you. This is about your family. It's corrupted. I could smell it on you from miles away. I swallowed. If you're not going to hurt me, what else do you want from me? Julius was smiling at me through the mirror. His mouth revealed a set of rotted teeth. Ooh. Being what I am, it's lonely. The fact that your family is corrupted isn't a bad thing. You know, maybe you could introduce me to some of them sometime, one day. We were on an empty road. There were no people around, nobody that I could ask for help, but I still hit the brakes. I felt sick, but not from whiplash. You're wondering whether you should jump out of the car. Wondering if you could outrun me, he sighed. But you won't. I took a deep breath. No, I won't, I whispered. Because you love your family. I nodded. And because you noticed that the eyes of your daughter have recently started to look a little bit like mine. <laughs> he smiled again and I stayed frozen. Maybe you could check her reflection, my friend. Are your eyes open? Um, that's the end. Oh, he said that his daughter was, you know, strange but he was just being like maybe because she's a teenager but julius is like she's one of me mm -hmm. someone in the comments said why the cliffhanger are you too afraid to look into things further or are you afraid to share what happens next is julius your new son-in-law <laughs> because the daughter the daughter uh -huh. is just like julius so maybe he married married the taxi driver dill daughter mm -hmm. well that was that story let us know your guys's thoughts about that previous story but um i'm just gonna read like a my favorite two cents horror stories i'm probably gonna read those in between like after every long story so this one is dad there's something under my bed my daughter screamed but i was too scared to go out and save her hiding under her bed in her kidnapper's house i couldn't help but wonder why she called him that her dad the kid's dad mm -hmm. is under the his daughter's, daughter's bed. bed so the daughter He's imagine the daughter's room. The mm -hmm. dad is under her bed, but the daughter is like, dad, there's something under my bed, which is her original dad. But she might be brainwashed by the kidnapper thinking that the kidnapper is her dad. Mm -hmm. So the daughter seeing her real dad under the bed, but doesn't know it's her real dad and then calls in the kidnapper. And now the dad is uh, scared that uh -huh. the kidnapper is going to be like this comment literally said what I was trying to say. Um, they said, I love the tension that comes from not knowing if the girl was kidnapped and, and brainwashed or if the man narrating the story is just a delusional maniac hiding under a random girl's bed. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I was trying to say. Okay, next nail is going to be this neon pink color and then I'm gonna sprinkle on some of this glitter and then we're gonna encapsulate it. This next story is under the subreddit No Sleep and the title is Something Walks Whistling Past My House Every Night at 3.03. Every night, no matter the weather, something walks down our street whistling. You can only hear it if you're in the living room or the kitchen. When they walk by, it always starts at exactly 3.03. .03. The sound starts faint, somewhere near the beginning of the lane near the Carson's place, like up the street, like mm -hmm. the beginning of the road. We're towards the middle of the street, so the whistling moves past us before fading away in the direction of the cul-de-sac. When I was younger, my sisters and I would sneak into the kitchen some nights to listen. My mom and dad didn't like that. We'd catch those hands if they found us out there but they were never too hard on us since we always stuck to the one big rule don't try to look at whatever was whistling mm. huh? my neighborhood is a funny place i lived here since i was six and i loved it <laughs> of course you're six years old <laughs> i lived here since i was six and i loved it the houses are small but well kept good sized yards plenty of places to roam there are lots of other kids here my age i turned 13 back in october we grew up together and we would always play four square in the cul-de-sac or roam around from back porch to back porch in the summer. This was a good place to grow up. I'm not old enough to see it, 
and there's only two strange things here the night whistling and the good luck the whistling never bothered me much like i said i couldn't even hear it from my bedroom but mom and dad didn't like to talk about it so i stopped asking questions my dad is a strong guy tall and calm he has an accent since he moved to the u.s as a kid his family my grandparents they're from the islands that's what they called it my dad the only time he isn't so calm is if the whistler comes up he talks a little quicker then his eyes move faster and he tells us not to think about it and to always remember that one rule the big rule don't try to look outside when the whistler goes past not that we could look even if we wanted See, there are shutters on the inside of every window, thick pieces of heavy canvas that pull down from the top and latch to the bottom of the window frame. Each latch even has a small lock about the size of what you find on, find on a diary. My dad locks those shutters every night before we all go to bed and keeps the key in his room. My mom, I don't know what she thinks about the whistling. I've seen her out in the living room before at 3.03 when the sound starts. I could hear her if she cracked my door open just an inch to peek. She's not out there often, at least I haven't caught her much, but once, once or twice a month, I think she sits out there on our big red couch just listening. The whistler has the same tune every night. It's cheerful. Da da dee dum 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 dee dum dum. <laughs> Which Lady Gaga song is it? I literally tried to look at every one of her songs and I could not find this one. Please, in the comments, please help. What is that Lady Gaga song? Dum dum dee dum 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 dee. I had this story saved for months and I've pre-read this. This whole time I've been trying to figure out what the Lady Gaga song is. Like I just, I just can't sing like the first verse. Like it just doesn't pop into my head. In the story it really does go. It's like da 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 dum da 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 dum. Remember how I said there are two odd things about where I live? Well, besides our night whistler, everyone in my neighborhood is really lucky. It's hard to explain, and Dad doesn't like us talking about that part much either. But good thing just seems to happen to people around here a lot. Usually it's small things, winning a radio contest or getting an unexpected promotion at work or finding some arrowheads buried in the yard. You know, the authentic kind. The weather is pretty good and there's no crime and everybody's gardens bloom extra bright in the fall. A million little blessings, I've heard my mom say about living here. But the main reason we stay here, why we moved here in the first place, is my sister, Nola. She was born very sick something with her lungs we couldn't even bring her home when she was born only visit her in the hospital she was so small i remember smaller even compared to the other babies a machine had to breathe for her we moved into our house here to be closer to the hospital as soon as we moved here nola started getting better the doctors couldn't figure it out they chalked it up to whatever they were doing but we all could tell they were just as confused <laughs> but my parents knew even i knew nola getting better was just another one of those million little blessings we got for living in our neighborhood this one looks purple compared to the rest it was pink on its it own it was pink on its own so that's why we stayed even after we found out that for every small miracle that happens here every day now and then some bad things happen but they only happen if you look for the whistler see our neighborhood has a welcoming committee they show up with macaroni casserole and a gift basket and a manila folder whenever someone moves in they're very friendly four people show up when we moved in seven years ago the committee made small talk gave me a snickers bar and took turns holding nola it was her first week out of the hospital so they were extra careful then the committee asked to speak to my parents in private, so I was sent to my room where I still managed to hear nearly every word. The welcoming committee told my parents about how nice the neighborhood was, hard to explain kind of nice, and then they told my parents about the even harder to explain whistling that happens every morning at 3.03 a.m. and ended at the tick of 3.05. The group, our new neighbors, warned my parents that the whistling was quiet would never harm or hurt us as long as we didn't look for what was making the sound. This part they stressed and I pushed my ear into the door straining to hear them. People who went looking for the whistler had their luck change. Sometimes tragically, a black cloud would hang over anyone that looked. Anything that could go wrong would. The manila envelope that the committee brought over contained newspapers, clippings, stories about car crashes and ruined mm -hmm. lives, public deaths and freak accidents. Regular everyday press on, you know, your average gal would wear. Nails. Not everyone dies, I heard the head of the committee tell my dad, but the life goes out of them. Even if they live, there's no more light in them. 
ever again. My mom, I could tell she wasn't taking it seriously. She kept asking if this was some prank they play on new neighbors. At one point, my mom got angry and accused the committee of trying to scare us out of our new home. My dad calmed her down, told her he can tell our new neighbors were sincere and that they were just trying to help us out. He explained that he grew up hearing these kinds of stories from his mom and that he knew that there were strange things that walked among us. Some of those strange things were good and some were bad, but most were just different. After the committee left, dad went to the hardware store, bought the canvas blinds, the latches, and the locks, and installed them on every window in the house after dinner. The first night in our new house, I crept out of my room at 3 a.m. only to find my dad awake, sitting on the living room couch, holding my baby sister. My dad held up his finger in a shush motion, but patted me to the couch next to him. I sat and we waited. At exactly 3.03, we heard the whistling. Bum, bum, dee, dum, bum. <laughs> it came out just like our neighbors said. The whistling returns each night and we never look and we enjoy our million little blessings every day. Nola breathes on her own and she's grown into a strong, clever girl. My dad even joined the welcoming committee. We don't get new neighbors often. Why would anyone want to leave? But when a new family moves in, my dad and the committee brings the macaroni casserole, a gift basket, and the manila folder. I can always tell by the look on my dad's face when he comes back if the family took the committee seriously or if we'd be getting new neighbors again very soon. <sighs> Not long ago, a family moved in directly next to us. The previous owner, Mrs. Maddie, passed away at the age 105. She lived a very good, long life. Our new neighbors seemed like they'd fit in just fine. They believed the welcoming committee took my dad's advice about locking the shutters since they had a young child of their own. Whatever newspaper clippings were in that manila envelope, whatever evidence, my dad never lets us seize. But I imagine it must have been awfully convincing since our neighbors got along with no issues for the first month. One night, when our new neighbors had to leave town, they sent their son Holden to stay with us, a year under me in school. I didn't know him well before that night, but as soon as his parents dropped him off after dinner, I could tell it was going to be a bad time. Do you know who is always out there whistling every night? Holden asked the moment the adults left the room. The three of us were sitting in the den, some Disney movie playing idly on the television. My sister and I exchanged a glance. We don't talk about that, I said. I think it's that weirdo that lives in the big yellow house on the corner, Holden said. Mr. Tolles? My sister asked. No way. He's really nice. Holden shrugged. Maybe he's a psycho killer then. Nola tensed. We don't talk about it, I repeated. Let's go in my room and play Nintendo. We spent the next few hours playing games, eating popcorn, and then watching movies. A typical sleepover, but I could see Holden was getting angsty. After my parents had wished us a good night, locked the blinds, and gone to bed, Holden stood up from his bean bag and began to walk over where Nola and I were sitting on my bed. Have you ever tried? You know, looking, he asked. It's nearly time. Like most sleepovers, we'd conveniently ignore any suggestion of a bedtime. I was shocked to see he was right. It's almost 3 a.m. I sighed. Okay, next nail is gonna be this glow-in-the-dark pink color for the pinky nail. See, I can't, I can't even try to look because my dad locks the blinds every night and hides the key, he continued, also ignoring me. So does our dad, said Nola. No, replied Holden. No, he doesn't. You saw him do it, I said, a little sharper than I meant to sound. Holden grinned. Your dad locks the blinds. Yeah, but he doesn't hide the key. He keeps it right on his normal keychain. So, I asked, worried. I already knew what he was gonna say next because I had noticed that my dad didn't bother hiding the key anymore after all these years because he knew we took it seriously. So after your dad locked up, but before your parents went to bed, I went to the bathroom, and on my way, I may have peeped into their room, and I may have seen your dad's keychain on his nightstand, and I maybe went and borrowed the keys to the blinds. <laughs> Nola and I stared at him, and his grin only grew wider. <laughs> You're lying. You're lying, I said. Holden shrugged. You can check if you want. Just open your parents' door, and you'll see that his key's right there on the nightstand. Stay here, I told them both. Don't move a muscle. I hurried over to my parents' room, but hesitated at the door. If Holden wasn't lying, my dad would be angry, beyond angry. I was scared thinking about it, but more scared of an open window with the whistler right outside. I'd opened the door barely an inch, and I looked in. It was too dark to see. Taking a deep breath, I walked into the room. Two steps into the dark, I froze. The whistling started, and I could hear it clearly. 
from my parents' room. I never realized, but they must have heard the sound every night since we moved into the house. They never told us. I don't think I could have slept through it. I stood there listening to the whistling come closer, unsure whether I should turn on a light or call out for my dad. Soft sounds from the living room brought me back to reality. Nola! I yelled, running out of my parents' room. The parents should wake up. Mm -hmm. Holden and Nola were standing near the front door next to a window. Holden wasn't lying. I could see him fumbling with the lock on one of the blinds. I heard a click. He did have the key. Holden let out a quick laugh. Nola stood next to him, hunched up, afraid, but maybe curious. The whistling was right outside our house now. I think I made a sound, called out. I can't remember. Time felt frozen. Clock hands nailed to the face, but I found myself moving. I'm not fast. I've never been athletic. Somehow though, I covered the space between myself and Nola in a moment. My eyes were locked on her, but I heard Holden pull the blinds all the way down so it could release. I heard the snap of it start to raise, and I heard the whistling just on the other side of the window. But I had my arms around Nola, and I turned us so she was facing away from the window. At the same time, I jammed my eyes shut. The blind whipped open. The whistling stopped. I felt Nola shaking my arms. Don't look, okay? I told her, don't turn around. We were positioned so that she was facing back towards the hallway and I was facing the window. My eyes were still closed. I felt her nod in my, nod in my shoulder. I reached out with the arm not holding Nola and tried to touch Holden. My hand brushed against his arm. He was shaking, worse than Nola. Holden, I asked. Silence. I reached past him and gingerly felt for the window, eyes still sealed shut. The glass was cold against my fingertips colder than it should have been for the time of this year. I moved my hands up the window, searching for the string to the blinds. The glass began to get warmer the further I reached, and there was a gentle hum feeding back into my fingertips. I tried not to think about what might be on the other side of the window. Finally, I touched a string and yanked the blind shut. I opened my eyes. In the dim light leaking out from the kitchen, I could make out Holden, pale and small, staring at the now closed window. <laughs> Holden, I asked again. He turned towards me and he screamed. Everything began a flurry of motions. Lights sparked to life in the hall, then the living room. My parents' footsteps thudded across the hardwood floor. I didn't turn to look back at them. My eyes were glued to Holden. He was pale, had bit his lips so hard they were a thin red line of blood running down from his chin and he'd wet himself. Now girl, that's just embarrassing. <laughs> what happened? My dad asked from behind me. I managed to swivel away from Holden and look back. He looked. I'd never seen my dad scared before, but I saw it that night. In that moment, an old ugly terror stitch on his face. A parent's fear. Just Holden, he mouthed to me. I nodded yes. My dad let out a breath. He looked so relieved, I nearly expected him to cheer. But then he turned to Holden, and my dad's face changed. I wonder if he felt bad for feeling good that Holden was the only one that looked? There was a knock at the door. We all froze. Holden whimpered. Answer it, my mom said. She stood at the threshold of the hallway. I'd always thought she was a skeptic and just humored by my dad about the windows and the whistler, but that night we were all believers. I noticed that both of my parents held baseball bats. They must have taken from their bedroom. The knock came again, a little louder this time. Please don't open the door, Holden whispered. My dad walked over to him, hugged him close. We won't, my dad promised, still holding his bat. Nothing is coming in here tonight. Thud, thud, thud. This time the knocking was loud enough to rattle the door. Holden screamed again and Nola clutched her arms around my neck. My mom came over and knelt down next to us, wrapping my sister and me close. Thud, thud, thud. Call the police, my mom whispered to my dad. The knocking instantly stopped. My dad looked over his shoulder at us. Do you think he was cut off by a frantic knocking that trailed off to a polite tap, tap, tap? Police, something said from the other side of the door. The voice from outside it sounded exactly like my mom, like a parrot repeating the words back to her. Police, call the police. Tap, 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 <laughs> police. My mom pulled us closer. Police, 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 police. Please stop, I heard her whisper. I don't think calling them will help, my dad said. How will we know when they are the ones at the door? The knocking came back harder than before. The door shook, then it stopped. After a long moment, I heard the knocking again, but it was coming from our back door. We all turned towards the back door, but the knocking returned to the front door. 
front to back, back to front, loud then quiet, then loud again. Suddenly, the sound was coming from both doors at once. Big, heavy blows like a sledgehammer. And something started tapping against all the windows in the house. Then the walls. It was like we were living inside a drum with a dozen people trying to play at once. Or we were a turtle and something was attempting to claw at us from our shell. Stop! Holden yelled. The knocking died. I won't tell, Holden said, staring at the door. I promise. I won't tell anyone what I saw. Just please, please go away. We waited for a minute. Then we heard it, a soft tapping. Coming from the window, Holden had looked through earlier. Holden started to cry, sobbing like a prisoner, watching gallows being built outside their cell. My dad held him, brushed his hair, but never lied to him, never told him things would be okay. Tapping at the window went on for the rest of the night. We huddled together in the living room for I don't know how long. Eventually, my mom tried to take us kids into the room while my dad stayed to watch the door. But the second we moved into my bedroom, the knocking came back so loud it was impossible to ignore. I was afraid the door couldn't take it. We went back to the living room and the knocking stopped. Only the tapping on the window remained. None of us slept that night. The tapping stopped around 7 a.m. That's about the time the sun comes up here. We waited another two hours before my dad opened the blinds from one window. He made us all go back to my parents' bedroom first. I heard him open the door, then come back in. Holden's parents came back around lunchtime. My mom and dad walked Holden over to his house and they all went inside for quite a while. Nola and I watched from the window. She stuck to me the whole day, right by my side sometimes holding my hand. I would too, I'm scared. When my parents came back, they looked grim, but wouldn't tell us what they said to Holden's family. It was a Sunday, so we spent the whole day together, ordered pizza and watched movies. That night, everyone slept in my room. Nola and my mom in the bed with me, my dad in a chair he'd pulled over. There was no knocking that night or any night since. We didn't see much of Holden or his parents for the rest of the week, but by Thursday, there was a moving truck in their driveway. <sighs> Nola and I watched them pack up the whole afternoon after school. What sticks with me the most is how tired Holden and his parents looked. All three had the same grim mouths and lightless eyes. Even from across the street, I could tell something was very wrong. Holden and his family were gone before sunset. They probably couldn't get any sleep. Maybe all the knocking and tapping went to their house. So I think they, it knows whoever's looking at it. I remember what the original welcoming committee said to my parents when we moved in. Not everyone who looks at the whistler dies, but even those that live have the light go out of them and the rest of their lives are full of misfortune. A million little tragedies. I think Holden's parents must have looked either to comfort him if they didn't believe or share the burden if they did. I watched Nola some days, happy and young and alive, and I wonder if I'd been slower if she looked out the window that night, what would, would I have looked to, to comfort her, to share that burden? I'm glad I don't have to find out. We still live in that house, in that neighborhood. We still hear our whistler walking past every night. The blessing, the luck, the good things here are too good to leave, but we're careful. We don't have friends over to spend the night anymore, and my dad hides the keys to the blinds very, very well. Not that I've gone looking. Some things you just don't need to look for. The end. Pretty interesting. That was a good one. I think this is a pretty cool story. Like, really cool. I just hate how that kid sleeping over had to just do that. Like, what are your guys' thoughts? Would you want to live in this neighborhood? But the catch is that whistling man. Thumbnail is going to be this other hot pink color, but this one is opaque. It's not jelly. I really enjoyed that last story. It was, it was like told really well mm -hmm. and it was pretty creepy. So I'm going to be reading a two sentence horror story. Of course, your total is 9-11. Please pull forward. I said they work through like you know, they like work at McDonald's through the mm -hmm. fast food, you know, they're pull like that to the person. next window. Yeah. Your total is 9-11. Please pull forward, I said, a single tear running down my cheek as I spoke quietly into the headset. I watched the masked man run the knife repeatedly into the manager on the floor, knowing I would be next if another customer lingered too long. Do you get it? Mm-mm. Mm -mm. Basically, she works in the fast food, like I said. There's a killer in their restaurant and i guess he wants to get all the customers out of the driveway faster 
Mm -hmm. And so he's hurting the manager because a customer was taking like too taking long? too long. Yeah. One comment said, very traditional fast food management technique. If drive through times get too high, then the district manager will repeatedly stab the floor manager to motivate the workers to move faster so they are not next. <laughs> at least this is how things were run when I worked at Jack in the Box. What? That's one of the comments. Okay, this next story is on a different subreddit. I think I'm gonna try to find more stories from here because these, like, I pre-read some and these are really good. The subreddit is Let's Not Meet and the title is The Man on My Patio. It says, warning, this is a long post, but I recommend you read it all. Oh yeah, girl, I'm gonna read it all. So this happened when I was around nine years old. I'm 25 now and it's something I will never forget. It's gi It gives me goosebumps to this day. I live in a terrace house, which is four houses combined, and my neighbors and I have our own little patio. There's a small road about 10 meters from my yard where people do their Sunday walks and so on. Only a small fence separates my small yard and the patio from that road. I live in a pretty crowded area with several of these terrace houses spread around my neighborhood. So seeing people walk on that road is pretty normal for me. Seeing random people standing on my patio is not because their patio has a fence over it. Mm -hmm. You know, like he said, there's the patio, like their front door, patio, fence, and then road. When I was nine, I usually got home from school about an hour before my mom got home from work. I live maybe 50 meters away from the school, so my mom figured I was mature enough to be home alone for around an hour before she got home. I locked the front door and double checked that the back door leading to the patio was also locked. I was nine, being alone was a little scary even though it was in the middle of the day and only for one hour. I then rushed to my room upstairs to play as much PlayStation as I possibly could before my mom came home and made me do my homework. While playing, I heard this noise coming from outside my window. My room was located one floor over the patio with a view to the road I told you about before. It was kind of like the sound of a cat, but my cat had been missing for over three months. Hope sparked in me and I thought, OMG, did he finally come back? I ran downstairs to check if it was my cat, but the sight that met me gave me goosebumps just writing this. There was a guy standing on my patio, <sighs> a tall guy with black hair covering half of his eyes. I fell in love, love with, with an emo, emo girl. girl. Him looked like a male version of the ring woman or something. I could hear him making high pitched sounds, almost like a cat meowing. Mm -mm. A brown liquid was running down from his mouth and I could see him spitting out my dad's stomped cigarettes. What? He was actually eating from the ashtray. I was frozen observing this. Can you imagine you see some guy just eating cigarettes? Eventually snapped out of it and screamed so loud that the Why man must have heard it. Why you They're nine. He didn't react. He kept on eating from the ashtray. Ew. I ran upstairs to my room, locked the door, and called my mom, who was... Who then called the cops. I've never been more terrified in my life. Laying in my bed under the sheets, shivering with fear. Fear as I hear these creepy high-pitched noises from the guy eating cigarettes from the ashtray on my patio. I kind of blacked out for a moment because the next thing that I remember is the police arriving on the road by my yard. I hear them talking to the guy saying stuff like, what are you doing? Get over here or we'll come down and arrest you and so on. He didn't respond, but the high-pitched sounds were more frequent and louder. I decided to look through the window, feeling safe now that the cops were there. I could see two police officers standing by my fence, one man and one woman. I did not see the creepy man, however, because he was standing directly one story under me and my field of view. The police jumped the fence, and I remember hearing the creepy guy screaming louder than anything I've ever heard before. He charged the female police officer with full force, and he freaking knocked her out <gasps> cold. The male officer then immediately tased the guy, leaving him shaking on the ground, still screaming still. The policeman struggled to put him to keep him on the ground while putting handcuffs on him, but eventually made it. After a while, he managed to wake up the female police officer who seemed to be hurt badly. He called for backup in an ambulance, and then he sees me standing in the window above him. The expression on my face must have been something else because he just looked at me and said, I sure as hell hope you didn't see any of that. I started to cry. By this time, neighbors start to arrive, wondering what the heck is going on. One of my neighbors, an elderly woman, made me come down and she took care of me until my mom came back. The police took the creepy guy with them in the car and left. 
Before they left, they promised to come back and talk to us about what had happened. This is where the story takes an unexpected turn. The male police officer came back later that night and sat down with me and my mom to talk. He explained that the guy on my patio was actually diagnosed with severe autism. He had escaped a facility where mentally challenged people lived, located around five kilometers from where I lived. He explained that the guy had actually been living in my house five years ago, but he had been I forced living to living in the house. <laughs> I thought uh, living in my yeah, house, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. He had been living in my house five years ago. Like, he previously yeah. lived there. And they're the new people that live there now. But he had been been forced to move when his mom, his only caretaker, died. The poor guy probably thought he would find his mom in my house. He missed the routine and he missed living there with his mom. The police had to move him from that house that time five years ago because he was extremely strong. From what I heard, he had extreme tension in the in the body because of the autism, making his muscles grow stronger and stronger throughout the years. A creepy story turned into sad story. <gasps> but he had to not he had to go to like a place that can take care of him because his mom died. And so he missed his mom, he missed the routine. I bet he probably like forgot or like mm -hmm. was just like just wanting to go back to the old days. This was the reason he reacted the way he did when the police came this day. Still frightened, I told the police officer that he needed to make sure this would never happen again. He promised it wouldn't. After a few sleepless nights, my life got back to normal. The years went by and the guy didn't come back until one year ago. <gasps> At this time, my mom and dad had moved out. I bought the house from them and I'm still living there today. I was enjoying the morning coffee on the patio when I see this random guy stopping on on the road by my fence. He just stands there looking at me. I look at him and give him a nod, and then I hear the high-pitched noises. Mm -mm. Holy mackerel, it's him. His hair had turned gray, but the high-pitched sounds made me realize. My heart started racing, and I instantly remembered the reason why he was back. I realized that he must have managed to escape again because I kept my cool a bit longer than when I was nine. I started to realize how sorry I felt for the guy. 16 years later and he was back to look for his mom. I decided to carefully ask him if he wanted to come down to the patio. He instantly jumped the fence. I started to think he would knock me out like he did to that police officer. He didn't. He just smiled. He looked at me and smiled. I offered him to sit down. He didn't respond. I offered him to come inside. He started laughing. We went inside. His face lit up, pure joy. He was home. It reminded him of the life he had with his mom. It almost made me tear up. All of a sudden, he sat down in my couch, turned on my TV, and switched directly to the cartoons. I observed him for a while. He was just completely focused on the cartoons. I just wanted him to enjoy the moment, so I didn't say anything to him. I realized I had to call the facility to let them know. The caretakers arrived 10 minutes later. After a lot of convincing, he got back up, crying, and they went back to the facility. I called the facility two days later. We made a deal. His name is Tom, and I now consider Tom my friend. Every Sunday from the day he returned, Tom and his caretakers visit me to watch cartoons. They say it's the highlight of his week. It makes my heart warm. Now for several years, my thoughts were, let's not meet guy on my patio eating from the ashtray. Now my thoughts are, let's meet every Sunday to watch cartoons, my friend Tom. That was kind of sad. That was so sad. Someone commented, great, now I have something in my eyes. They won't stop watering. You are an awesome person. <laughs> like, sad but happy. Yeah. Let us know your, what your thoughts were about this last story here. Okay, so here's how the nails are looking after all the poly gels on. This one sadly doesn't match really well. It's kind of purple, but... On its own, it looked pink, but next to these other pinks, it looks purple. But yeah, we're just gonna get shaping now. I have my McCart dust collector and a hand file. And yeah, let's just get reshaping these nails. Dum dum dee dum 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 dee. Are you on her like top songs? It's, it's gotta be a top song. You click through all her songs. No, here, I found it. Well, in the, when you searched up dum dum dee dum, <laughs> bruh, I think you didn't look hard enough. I did it. It's Rihanna's song. No wonder. <laughs> Hang on, pause. It's a remix that has Lady Gaga in it. It's a remix. I swear it was Lady Gaga. That is such an offense. My bad. Not even Lady Gaga, bro. You got it messed up. It's Rihanna. And I'm like, imagine we didn't find out. Imagine we didn't. <laughs>
Okay guys, we have all the nails shaped and buffed now and they're looking pretty good, except she doesn't match. So we're gonna make a pink tint for it. So I'm just gonna take some hot pink gel polish and I'm gonna mix it with some clear top coat. So I think this is tinted pink good enough. We're gonna cure this. Next step is gonna be adding on some gold butterflies onto this pointer finger. So I'm gonna take some rhinestone gel and I'm just gonna add it all over the nail because we wanna make sure these butterflies stay secured. And then you're just gonna wanna paint a layer of top coat over the rhinestone gel just to make sure that it's all evened out. Okay, now we're gonna add on some gold butterflies. Fine, but now the base is like not correct anymore. It's like all messed up. This is just not working out for us. Okay, so here's how the pointer finger turned out. I accidentally forgot to record it, but yeah, here's how it looks. It honestly was kind of hard. The butterfly just didn't want to stay. So these bigger charms, we're gonna adhere them. I'm gonna use clear poly gel because it's gonna be stronger. I'm gonna add on the poly gel. And I think I'm just gonna stick this one in right now. We have one last story from the same subreddit, Let's Not Meet. The title is Florida Woman Crawled Out of My Hotel Mirror to Rob Me. And there's also a picture which I'm going to be sending to Vic so she can insert it for you guys so you can see it to add to the creepiness. This past Monday, my coworkers and I returned to our hotel from a day of work out in the field. Rebecca and I walked to our rooms and as we stood outside of our rooms, I opened mine and I saw someone in the bathroom. I said, hello? Nobody answered. My first instinct was that it was a cleaning lady in there for some reason, and then I saw my bag with my clothes in her hands. I said to the co-worker, there's a woman in my room. Then I asked the woman, what are you doing with my stuff? It gets a little fuzzy because I can't remember everything I said and what she said, but she kept mumbling about how her key still worked and how it still worked and that's how she got in. I was in shock and she was obviously very flustered having been caught mid robbery. I was in shock and she was obviously very flustered having been caught mid robbery. She dropped my bags and fumbled around with her purse and a white plastic bag. By this time, my coworker was behind me watching all the insanity unfold. This woman was scrambling and walking towards the door. And I said, what's in the bag? Thinking it's probably my stuff. And so she said, no, 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 it's, it's just my things. It's just my things, I'll show you. And she did. I looked and I didn't see any of mine. And so since I'm obviously in shock at this time, I, I just let her leave. I went into my room and it's been ransacked. I did a quick look around to see if anything had been taken. All of my electronics were still there. I, then I went into the bathroom and I saw my underwear, my bikini, and my clothes shoved into my own bags randomly. Even my passport was shoved in there. Then I looked on the counter and I saw that she got into my medication. I'm not sure what was going through my head at that moment other than I wanted it back. So I ran out the door to go find her. I ran to the laundry room downstairs and out to the size of the hotel and I didn't see her. I realized I was never going to find her. So my coworker and I went down to the lobby to tell them what happened and then we called the police. We went back up to my room to wait and I noticed that there is a metal bat on my bed and a little larger than one of those novelty wooden bats you can get at any baseball game. But there's also a flashlight on the end. She must have left it behind in her hurry. She also left behind a necklace that must have fallen out of her bag when she was scrambling with mine. I was mostly freaking out at this point because I thought she'd gotten away with my medication that I needed. The police got there and took our statements and looked around the room as well. One thing that I noticed was there were bits of drywall in the sink and I pointed that out to the cops, but none of us really knew where it came from. We started looking at the door and the windows to see if she pried her way in somehow. 
but there was nothing. So we kind of just went with the idea that she had a spare key or something, even though the hotel front desk was adamant that there's no way that could be. The officer that came brought two more officers as backup because they thought the woman might still be in the vicinity. But after our statements were taken, there was nothing else they could really do, so they left. I sat down to finally make some calls to tell people, and as I'm on the phone, I'm thinking about the drywall in the sink, and it still didn't make any sense to me. So I'm on the phone and looking at the drywall and the mirror on the wall right above it, and then it hits me. I got my coworker and asked her to help me pull this mirror off the wall. And we took the mirror down and there's a hole that's just big enough for a desperate junkie to squeeze through. I asked Brian and Rebecca if I should call the cops again to let them know that I found this. And my boss said, there's still two cops cars in the parking lot. So I went down to tell them and the female cop kind of rolled her eyes, but the young guy said, I'll come check it out. <sighs> Yikes. Golly, girl, like, what are you rolling your eyes for? They both came back up, looked in the hole, and found a pillow, blanket, cigarettes, clothes, mm -hmm. toothbrushes. This woman had been living in the wall behind my mirror for God knows how long. She had access to me and my room at all times. I know it might be hard to picture that there, there was a crawl space about two feet wide in between the two rows of rooms. And... One of the officers called the original officer to come back and take pictures of this. She explained to him what's going on and all I hear over the radio is no freaking way. He comes back, takes pictures, and is just as mind blown as the rest of us. Obviously, we packed up and left immediately. What's even crazier is she probably has been the last time we stayed at this hotel. I would randomly smell cigarette smoke and I assumed someone was smoking in their bathroom and it was traveling through the vents. But nope, a junkie was smoking just on the other side of my mirror. She had access to other rooms too. The holes in the walls were from a renovation and the hotel hadn't properly patched and just covered it up with mirrors. She could have been hanging out in people's rooms when they were gone. Th that's the end. Oh. So it's basically she found that hole and someone was staying in it. And you've seen the picture. It's, it's kind of eerie that if you know like someone's staying in there. But that's the end of my Reddit stories for today. I'll have more in the next video because this is only part one of my hand. Give me two seconds. We're gonna take off this nail. It just doesn't go, right? So we're gonna take this off and restart, start fresh. It was the pink tint that was messing it up. Yeah, I mean, I know it's purpley, it. but- We should've just it's... let it live. Yeah, we should've just let it do its thing. I think that was where we messed up. We were trying to hide who she really was. <laughs> the teddy bear is doing one of these heart poses, you know? I thought it was the middle finger. These are good. Anyway, we're gonna finish this off with some cuticle oil because, you know, they're already top coated. Here are how the nails turned out. Let me know what you guys think of this nail set in the comments. Sister Spice, what do you think of this set? I'm obsessed. Birthday Kawaii Nails Part 1 Complete. Oh yeah, these were some really fun nails to do. The only ones that gave us trouble was this nail. As you saw, we did it like two times over because it just wasn't looking right. They turned out really nice. They really did. And I kind of like how it was like a simple set because they were all pretty much one color, but the charms was what brought it, you know, mm -hmm. brought it all together. If this pointer finger didn't teach you a lesson of just be yourself at the end of the day, I don't know what will, girl. <laughs> Try to make her something she was not. Let us know in the comments which nail color is your favorite. I honestly think my favorite is the thumb color. I just like how bright and just hot pink it is. I really like it. What's your favorite color of these nails, Spice? <laughs> My favorite color would probably have to be this jelly nail or this glitter nail. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I love jelly nails and I'm a glitter girl. Yeah, this glitter one honestly turned out really good. It like really went with it. Charms. Can we talk about these charms? These charms are just so good. Yep. 21st birthday pink kawaii poly gel nails. 
these are so cute part one of course we're gonna do the other hand in the next video it was all about the charms for this nail set so we honestly finished this nail set pretty quick like a good time for when we started as well these are some chunky clonkers but anyway i think that's pretty much it for this video thank you guys so much for watching i hope you all enjoyed make sure you come back for part two which is the next video which is going to be her other hand we'll talk to you guys next time bye chunky clonkers out nice